Prepare to fire. Fire. Brent, uh, work. Fun. Advanced cartridge. Move. Ramp. Pick and fry. Fire. Fire. I am Lieutenant Don Walker of the 7th Company, 3rd Battalion, Royal Regiment of Artillery. We run two three-pound light infantry cannon, uh, so we support the infantry in the field like a modern-day automatic, like. M60 type weapon. Uh, we run out ahead of the bat the infantry during the, when the battle starts and start shooting the, the bad guys with solid shot hoping they change their mind and go home for the day. They usually don't so they get closer we change to canister shot which is like a giant shotgun blast and we shoot them as they get closer and hopefully that changes their mind. If it doesn't then we fall back in line with the infantry <laughs> and continue supporting the infantry. At the time there are first-hand accounts of British artillery getting 11 rounds per minute. After the first uh, we are <laughs> doubtful that was actually obtained. Uh, we're probably looking at about six rounds a minute. It is very regimented. If, it, if it's not regimented, then one person not in control, then disaster can strike and you can lose an arm or worse, you can lose a cannon and a whole crew. The specific impression we have is during Burgoyne's campaign yeah. of 1777. At the Battle of Saratoga, <laughs> roughly 80 to 85 percent of the artillerymen were, were killed in the first hours of the battle. So we, they, they sustained a lot of losses. I'm Major Alan Goditis from Florence, Mass. Four. Now these here people here I got were people that were, four, were in the 10th Mass from Conway natives. And one of them here died of smallpox before they even got into the battle. As you can see down here the pictures of our first fort, fort outside of Washington, D.C., Fort Brightwood. Bob Camp Brightwood. And this here is done, written by Don, John Donovan, who was a reporter by the fall of 10th Mass for the whole war. He's a reporter for the Springfield Union and the Birch Eagle. John Donovan was a deaf mute, and he fought us through all three years of the war. I kind of like to think that's his uh, self portrait. On this side, you'll see the balloon. Company I, Company K were on a balloon corps and they tattered the balloons, held the ropes. What did the balloons do? Well, they were on observation. They were up, up aloft, they could spot the enemy at about five miles off, and they could note they had a telegraph, and they'll send down a message, Morse code, and say enemy in sight five miles west, or however, on such such a road. We're in a third corps. The 6th Corps, 3rd Division, blew we at Gettysburg. Some, some of our guys were, company were supposed to take a little round top to help uh, General Chamberlain and fight off General Oates' his Confederates on the round top. Uh, well, four years ago we did our fundraiser because our monument got just uh, vandalized at Gettysburg and we did a fundraiser for $1,000 get the repair work done. And right now our monument is in its original state as it was in 1886 when it was brought to Gettysburg. What was the size of the regiment? We, were th we, were, we started out a thousand strong and then after Antietam we kind of lost our strength and we were up down to 700. And a few of the lieutenants came back to Northampton area for recruiting but we never got the recruits so we never became a full bird colonel or full regiment. We went, went through the whole rest of the war as, as a lieutenant colonel without a full regiment. We were all in the early part of the war, as I'll show you on our flag. This was straight a battle 
the battles that were in in the early part of the war in the Army, the Army of the Potomac. I'm getting a pork roast ready to go onto the fire. And I'm just. I, I, heard, I heard it go. You have to get it onto okay. the spit and secure it. Now, you know what? Fall. Let go, Liz. Okay. Because what I'm going to do, I'm going to tip it over and let the meat shake down a little bit. Okay. To the favor, spit. Hold, hold this up here. You can see the spit. Has, see how the slots are in those spit? These pieces go through and skewer the meat onto the spit. And if it's properly secured, then you can rotate it over the fire and it won't just fall off. How many pounds is that what you get here? This is about seven or eight pounds. Okay. Oh, and of course now it's raining again. Yep. Yeah. There we go. Perfect. Okay. Oh, we're so nice. Now, now you're going to stick one in the middle? Yes. If we can figure out the spacing. All right. You hold that. <laughs> and let's see. Does that have this? See, that one, they're all in a line. That's what I was this thinking this would be. So it's about. Well, here's the easy way. About here. Yeah. Punch a little hole in there. Now I have no idea which direction which direction this one goes. So we may just hey, Kathy. Uh, I didn't realize that on one of these the directions go in opposite. Do you know which way? Where are the states? Well, in our, our era, it's more about the making room. So, to take it apart and together, try to, you know, just some video. Look bigger and badder. <laughs> that, that, it, was, it was in the Napoleon style. Everybody was right together. You can go this way. Right, and that's your era is when. That's why it's confusing. I'll give you the rope. That's what it was. You're asking me for the rope? Yeah. That rope right there on the ground. It was working. I my name's Kathy. I'm from New Hampshire. <laughs> and I'm making a broom. So I would hope you would all have your brooms made by this time of year. <laughs> so this is a wooden broom um, split out from a piece of yellow birch. This birch was harvested on Wednesday, which means it's three days old now and um, three days old from cutting it. This morning I took the bark off. Some of the bark is behind me still. And you can see why it's called yellow birch. Very yellow color. And um, all I do is cut back strips of wood until they remain on. So I'm cutting through the growth rings. You know how a tree has concentric circles? I'm cutting through the growth rings with my knife and splitting them back piece by piece. And when I get down about a growth ring worth thickness, it'll remain on. I decide the height on my own. I've decided I want my broom to be about this long in terms of the uh, withies. After I finish getting about another quarter inch off, I'll flip the broom over. And I'll do the same process on the other side. So now you can kind of see how the broom evolves. So I'll split back from the top down, all the way around, about, probably about three quarters of an inch thick, all the way around, and that will be my broom. And then I'll whittle off the remaining thickness down to a finished uh, broomstick, 
diameter, about an inch in diameter, and that's it. Then I simply tie off my remaining pieces of wood here with another piece of wood, and that will hold and fix the broom in place. So it's a pretty simple process. In the 18th century, in this area, um, these brooms might be made from yellow birch, which is a waste wood. It's not a good wood for um, building. It's too fibrous. It does not a good basket wood. It's good for splitting out. <laughs> it, you can burn it. It's, it's hard enough to get some good coals for burning, but as I said, it's not good for much else. So you might pull it out of a water area where you might want to dig out um, a small pond for your cattle. For instance. My name is Liz Henderson. I'm actually with the horse group, the cavalry group, Sheldon's Horse, and I am um, would probably best be called a camp follower or support person. My unit was a little different than others because the women there actually were paid. Um, we were considered to be ground support for the horsemen. Um, so we helped take care of the animals, we helped get them on the road. Um, their job was to travel very light and our job was to make that possible. Um, we didn't do nice setups like this. This is a very, a very different type of camp setup. And what is happening here? This is a carpenter. No, a joiner, please. Joiner, oh, I beg your pardon, sir, a joiner. The carpenter builds the house. I finish the insides. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> and what are you working on here? I'm working on some molding. I've got several samples of moldings that I've made. Uh, if you'd like, I could come to your house, live there for about three months, and redo all your cove molding, woodwork, cabinetry, and um, you, you'll feed me, provide me a bed, and some spending money for the tavern, of course. And in two months you'll have a beautiful house. <laughs> what, what would you like me to do? Well, you know, whatever. I, I, I could put uh, cove molding like up there. I could put uh, a mop board down on the bottom of mm -hmm. your walls. Mm -hmm. How would you like your cabinets trimmed? Your I, windows? I I'm yeah, I never really want to I'm going to live in your house for two or three months. Because they were, they're a straight military unit. So you can see they're actually about to do a demonstration over there. But um, they traveled. Uh, they were General Washington's bodyguards, spies. Um, they traveled up and down the 13 colonies. Um, and they're called light dragoons because their purpose was to travel fast and light. Um, they carried very little. They didn't set up tentage. You'll see over in our camp we have, we have yielded to the need for shade by putting up a couple of flies, but mostly they didn't put up any tentage. They stayed at inns, they stayed at houses. If they were really desperate, they might camp out in somebody's barn someplace. Um, unlike many of the other units that traveled in large groups and would bring their, their tents, their cooking gear, and all of their support staff with them in kind of a herd. Good afternoon. <laughs> we are the second regiment Continental Light Dragoons, known as Sheldon's Horse, the first commissioned cavalry regiment in the history of the United States military. The 18th century drill, as would have been done uh, between the uh, years of 1776 and 1783. Being cavalry, a dragoon is a soldier trained to fight on, to fight on foot as infantry, also on horseback as cavalry, ride to the battle, dismount and fight, or fight on horseback. To that end, our uniforms and our equipment is tailored for use on horseback. The muskets are shorter than the standard infantry muskets, our coats are shorter than the standard infantry coats, we wear boots instead of shoes, and helmets instead of soft caps or hats. We're gonna do some a little drill, some firing demonstrations. We will drill with the horse in the hay head, and uh, we hope that you'll be uh, suitably entertained and educated this afternoon. Now what you're seeing right now is a standard infantry formation with the men shoulder to shoulder as a regular infantry regiment would have fought. But Dragoons were also trained to fight in the light infantry style using more unconventional tactics to fight in open order and use natural terrain. Take care to extend. Four paces to the left, to the left, face. Halt! Halt. Face front. 
In this formation, the soldiers are less susceptible to enemy gunfire because the weapons are inaccurate to begin with. They are now harder to hit. But say we wanted to take out the British artillery. They can still concentrate their fire inwards towards the artillery pieces and take out the artillery men working the guns. The right about face. To the front, march. Close to the center. Take care, halt. To the left, wheel. tube containing gunpowder and a musket ball. Now one of the things you need to operate the weapon is you have to have teeth, opposing teeth, one on top of the other, because you have to be able to bite the top off the cartridge. If you can't do that, no amount of gumming is going to open up that paper tube. There were men who did not want to serve who had teeth extracted rather than go into the military. I hope they enjoyed oatmeal for the rest of their lives. Well, actually, what I'm doing now is something completely outside of my unit. We're going to play a little music. Oh, great. Yes. And um, what my unit probably would have done, uh, most likely the, the men would have been in homes, so you would have had a sort of a normal daily um, get, up, get up and get dressed um, kind of uh, activity in the morning with breakfast and all being served, but the focus would be on getting the horse and the rider ready to go, rather than the more typical daily tasks of gardening and animal care and, and what have you. So it would have all been focused on equipping the men, taking care of the horses, and getting them ready to move out into the... Into, huh? Yeah, into the street. Would be sitting there all day long. And who knows where they would go? You might not see them again for quite some time. A typical um, afternoon, you've done most of your work, time for a break, or you're getting together with friends in the evening, especially in the wintertime, that would definitely be something that would be done. However, women normally would not be playing a reed instrument. Uh, they would be playing something that they held, rather, because uh, unfortunately playing a woodwind instrument makes your cheeks puff out, and it's just not Ladies lady were life. not supposed to do <laughs> anything that distorted them. They were supposed to look elegant and ladylike the whole time. However, um, and even things like violin, you know, you wouldn't have played. Although, heaven knows, if you could play a violin, you could go anywhere because that meant you could play dance music. And you were very well. Very, very popular. Three year olds with iron feet. Shall we? Sights, sounds, smells.
ballot. <laughs> thank you, thank you.